disappearances, reboots, and appearances, all on today's episode of Tap Out Talk. Welcome everybody to Tap Out Talk and this week's news, rumors, and more on episode 14, The Ten Bananments. We're going to go over, you know it's that time again, for A-E-W-W-E. Let's get into our first story. Ring of Honor's final battle. That will be the theme of Ring of Honor and this wrestling promotion who is going to take a major reboot. That's right. Ring of Honor is taking a page from a comic book world of doing a reboot. Think of it as the wrestling's version of the DC New 52. The company released a statement on Twitter stating the following, that the final battle pay-per-view in December, the company will take a hiatus for the first quarter of all of 2022 to reimagine Ring of Honor and will return with a super card of honor in April with new fan focused products. In conjunction with the announcement, Wrestling Observer's Dave Meltzer reports that all the wrestlers have been released from their contract. Following this report, we actually got here, as you guys can see, the statement that was made of Ring of Honor on their behalf of their company, and I will read it directly. Quote, Through the pandemic, our top priority was to keep everyone healthy and safe. And despite not producing any live events in over 18 months, we were able to keep everyone fully contracted. We now find ourselves at a time where we need to make changes to our business operations and are planning a pivot for Ring of Honor with a new mission and strategy. The year will culminate with a final battle in December, and we will be taking the first quarter of 2022 to work internally to reimagine ROH. ROH has the most dedicated fan base in the industry, and we appreciate your loyalty and patience, and we reconceptualize ROH. We anticipate the returning to live events in April for the Supercard of Honor with a new fan-focused product and provide a unique experience for wrestling fans, end quote. This was breaking news this week in wrestling. Um, You know, I do say it is a little sad to kind of see Ring of Honor have to take this route, but I do want to applaud Ring of Honor for staying so strong in the pandemic and not losing anybody during that time. That is such a huge for a company to be able to say. And I am interested to see what their refocused imagining is going to be for this brand. Um, I will get into this a little bit later in another episode of Tap Out Talk next week uh, where I will go over some of the wrestlers that are currently let go from contract and some speculation of where I think they may go. Um, There will be some interesting concepts of who will be retained and who will be released. But for now, I wanted to give you guys this breaking news on Ring of Honor status and kind of where it's going. So um, let's go ahead and go to our next story. Our next story is AEW related. It is Charlie Arnold, which is um, Charlie Arnold actually is no longer with the WWE. She was known there as Charlie Caruso, and now she's actually a reporter for ESPN and really enjoying the new portion of her career. She still pays attention to pro wrestling, especially AEW. Tony Khan's company has brought in many who the WWE let go for one reason or another. Justin Roberts. Dasha Gonzalez, and more used to work for the WWE. Charlie Arnold might fight and might fit right in. Um, There's East Coast Auctions recently had Charlie on where she um, spoke on the possibility of working for AEW. She put over Tony Khan in a huge way before teasing that she might make more than just a cameo in store for her. Um, She said, in quote, I'm a huge fan of Tony Khan. I'm a huge fan of Cody Rhodes and his wife Brandy. I have an um, I have to imagine that wherever they are putting together, there is gold. I will make it a point to tune in, and who knows, maybe one day I'll make a cameo or more than a cameo. I've known Tony for years and years. I was friends with Tony even before I took my job with the WWE. Long-standing relationship there. End quote. 
Charlie Arnold is very busy with her ESPN gig, but AEW could provide her an opportunity to get involved in pro wrestling once again. If she misses pro wrestling's business, there's a very good chance that Charlie could end up in a working relationship with AEW over WWE at this point. I love to hear this. Um, it's weird, right? Because Charlie, um, Charlie Caruso, formerly, right? She got her start in WWE, and she's one of those like the WWE seems to cycle people in and out of the system a little bit. She stuck out to me for a reason. There was something about her. I felt like she had that it factor. And she played to an audience in a very professional manner. And um, I did, you know, it wasn't shocking at all to me when I seen that she did go to ESPN. Um, you could tell she left a maybe a kind of a rough working environment. We're going to get into some of that working environment later here in the show. But one thing I will notice, um, I did like Charlie Arnold, and it is a little weird that again the WWE chose to like try to change her last name and you know give her that stage name like many of they do their performers, and I think that's just the way they try to control uh, likeness and persona, and that kind of is that entertainment factor, right? They want to own these characters, but the truth is, real news and real reporting is not owned by a character or a stage name. So, best of luck to Charlie. Um, I'm always look forward to her work on ESPN, and I definitely want to see what she would maybe bring to the AEW brand as a backstage host. But I don't know if it's an absolute necessary to have her in there. Me personally, I would do like to go for um, Renee uh, Young, formerly of the WWE, who's married to Dean Ambrose. I've always loved her work as well. But we wish Charlie the best here at Tap Out Talk. Let's move on. And we move on indeed to Solo Sokoa, uh, who debuts in the new NXT 2.0 at Halloween Havoc on Tuesday. You guys may have heard me briefly talk about him in one of the previous episodes of Tap Out Talk. The WWE has plenty of impressive superstars in their pipeline in NXT. Solo Sokoa has a pedigree to succeed in the WWE, and he made quite an impression on NXT 2.0 at Halloween Havoc this last Tuesday. Grayson Waller, another star, came out as Halloween Havoc's host. Then L.A. Knight made his presence known. Waller said something about Knight having car problems, setting up the story, who told... You, I had car problems, quoted Knight asked. Just when Waller blamed Chucky. By the way, Chucky, yeah, that's right. The Chucky from Child's Play was the host of Halloween Havoc that night from those the iconic horror movies, um, was on L.A. Knight's car issues. Solo Sokoa came out to make his debut, and he took out L.A. Knight, and Waller jumped out of the ring in a hurry and ran. So why is this kind of important? Sokoa is the Usos' younger brother, but the way they're kind of billing him right now, they're billing him as a street fighter in NXT. He certainly looks the part, and he's ready to rock the NXT 2.0 show. Uh, this might be a guy to watch in the future. I'll be interested in seeing how he develops in the ring. I will be paying kind of attention to his career, and it will be interesting to see in he when he goes to debut on the main roster, will he just be another factor in the faction? Or could he be strong enough to challenge Roman at maybe a pay-per-view with some development? Um, you guys might remember a while back I mentioned about doing this with uh, Tango Lao, um, another uh, member of the Samoan Dynasty family. So maybe Sokoa could fit that bill as the Uso's younger brother. Or he could just join the bloodline as I reported a few weeks back. Time will tell. Speaking of appearances, we also, Circle of Life, have a release in the WWE. Announcer Greg Hamilton has been released by the WWE. His release is a on a long list of names that the company has let go in recent memory. The 42-year-old ring announcer was hired in on 2015 and worked the NXT brand before he was called up on the main roster. Hamilton was a staple in the SmackDown brand. He received a lot of attention during the Shane McMahon time for how he announced him as the best in the world. So he kind of found his shtick so to speak, there. Um, it could His release could stem from legal issues. Um, recently this week, he threatened a, against a rapper, Westside Gun. The rapper, who is also a WWE super fan, used Hamilton's voice on a track without Hamilton's permission. Hamilton then went off publicly on social media and said that he will sue Gun, and he actually said that he would use WWE lawyers on his behalf to sue him. 
Um, it's unclear at this time whether the social media post was related to the West Side Gun directly was responsible for Hamilton's release, but this is a news story and we'll continue to get more information. Um, one of the things I find it interesting is that it look like, looks like Hamilton went into business for himself. And while that's good, I don't think he was a strong enough player in the company to go you know, saying things like that on public media. And as you guys know, the WWE is thinking of the Universe brand and they're stretching out and um, they don't want a rocky relationship in the music industry or the movie industry because they're trying to expand the WWE brand. So unfortunately, I feel like Greg Hamilton may have written a check that the WWE unfortunately had to cash. And when they cashed out, so to speak, Greg Hamilton was released in this situation. Um, the, honestly, I don't believe that Greg was on the exact level of, like, say, a Justin Roberts or somebody. But announcers seem to come and go in the WWE. And um, the reality is it's one of those jobs that could be replaced in People may not talk about this in three years, right, or even two years. So um, we'll see kind of where it goes from here, but I feel like the WWE did make a business decision. In our next story, I want to talk a little bit about Ahmed Johnson, who is a former WWF employee. And the reason is, is this topic came up recently on um, Jim Ross's uh, podcast, and he said, you know, one of his podcasts, he expected Ahmed Johnson to have more successful career in the wrestling business. Johnson worked for the WWE between 1995 and 1998, so for three years, before he did have a brief short spell with WCW. His biggest career accomplishment came in 96 when he won the Intercontinental Championship to become actually the first African American to hold the WWE singles title. Ross, who also... Um, Jim Ross actually works for the WWE Head of Talent Relations at the time. And again, he said on Grilling with JR that he thought Johnson would achieve more based on his appearance. Here's a quote. I thought Ahmed Johnson would be a bigger star simply because his 8x10 and his gift of gab, Ross said. He was a terrific BSer. And if you can recall, he had an amazing look and he had everything he needed physically, look, size, and height all jacked up. End quote. Um, Ahmed Johnson competed in his final match in 2003. And after a 14 year wrestling career, uh, Vince McMahon, you know, after a 14 year career, he really didn't do much after that. Um, me personally, I, you know, grew up in my teens, you know, watching Ahmed Johnson. And I remember seeing kind of the it factor with him. And I was a fan of his work. I remember um, he had that Pearl River plunge, right? That power bomb that was a sit down power bomb. He, um, you know, did go into the nation of domination for a little bit, but it was a uh, rumor that Vince had him removed because he felt like Ahmed made the nation too strong. And, I mean, maybe with The Rock that could be true. But the reality is um, I felt like Ahmed was a missed opportunity in the WWE, and I don't know if we'll ever really get to know truly kind of what happened. Now, I will say um, a friend of mine, uh, Chris Featherstone, who is a writer for a couple different, you know, uh, magazines, but also has his own podcast, Pancakes and Power Slams. Um, definitely has a lot of great guests on his show, and he works very hard at his craft and his podcast. But Chris actually had Ahmed on his show recently, and in which Ahmed actually did say that Vince McMahon um, told him he would basically never be inducted in the WWE Hall of Fame because him and Vince did have a falling out. Um, Ahmed did not get really into it. And, you know, Chris really didn't uh, push the issue on his podcast, which, again, I respect, right? You got to let these guys kind of talk about what they want to talk about and showcase them without being disrespectful. And, I, I, you know, Chris always does a fabulous job with that. So, you know, hats off to you. And actually, Chris just hit his 500th episode, which is just amazing. He's a beast, as I told him. But reality, a um, little tidbit about Ahmed. And I think there was so much potential that was untapped. And that's come up recently in the last few months. But, you know, we will maybe never know the true story about what happened to Ahmed Johnson. And now I want to give you guys a little more continuing reporting news is Charlotte Flair update here. So as you guys know, many fans, um, one of the things, you know, recently we had that thing on SmackDown last week with Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch and the title swap. And it's put the WWE in a tricky situation, right? And we've covered about how Charlotte's fiance, Andrade, formerly Cien Almas, is in AEW. And Ric Flair currently has left the WWE months ago because how they were booking Charlotte. 
So now, many fans are simply tired of Charlotte's Flair current booking in the WWE. She remains criticized for receiving too many title shots, which more deserving competitors should have gotten. In spite of all the outrage, the WWE is set on pushing Flair to the moon, and that is unlikely to stop anytime soon overall because she is a Flair and it's the brand. It seems Flair has heat on her um, for an interesting reason. Regardless, it cannot be argued that Charlotte Flair is, in my opinion, one of the best female in-ring performers in the company, that she has competed in several historic matches in the company. I want to remind you guys, I mean, yeah, she did have one of the three women that main evented the first ever female main event at WrestleMania, and that was Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch, and Ronda Rousey. Um, And the fact that Becky worked her way into that is even more amazing because I always said Flair and Rousey would be that main event for the WWE WrestleMania. Um, So as you guys like said, you might remember, she got into a verbal confrontation with Becky last week on SmackDown. It was said that Charlotte Flair had backstage heat on her as well. In addition to that, Flair also had a huge argument with Sonya Deville, apparently. In fact, Deville was so mad, she wanted to fight Flair right then and there. Um, This news is coming from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Um, It was said that one of the main reasons Charlotte Flair has heat on her has to be because of her in-ring style. The issue is that she is a heel but uses babyface moves, which traditionally does not happen in the industry. Um, There is a skill set for both, as you guys might not know, but it makes it harder for her opponents to get over when she uses you know, high-flying babyface moves as a heel. Um, There have been many that have been unhappy with her for the long time between Flair and many, if not most, of the women wrestlers on the roster for the little things and some things that have to do with the match structure. One of the complaints is that Flair wants to be a heel, um, and she is a heel, but does babyface moves during matches, notably like dives, moonsaults, in and out of the ring. Um, It was also said that Flair's inner circle also is pushing for her to get out of her WWE contract. And despite that, Charlotte Flair has quite a few years left on her current WWE contract. It seems to be seen what uh, will become of Charlotte Flair in the coming weeks. And it's highly unlikely that she'll go to AEW anytime soon. So I know that's the buzz right now is that Charlotte's going to AEW to join Andrade and to join the women's division. And don't get me wrong, that would be huge for AEW to land another high caliber star like Charlotte Flair. So um, I do think she would be an amazing fit anywhere she goes. She is a Flair. I am a fan of Charlotte. I like her work. Um, and she has worked very hard in this. And a lot of people give her grief for you know her father. And yes, her name has helped her. But her dad didn't help her as much. I remember um, he actually told her, well, you better not embarrass me. But he didn't really give her a lot of training until she was really taking it more serious. And I remember watching Charlotte in NXT for the first time, and I judged her very harshly and very incorrectly in the beginning. I said, oh, great, here's a girl living off her dad's name, trying to go out and make it. And she was an okay wrestler. She wasn't that good. And I watched her one or two weeks later, and I was like, wow, because I was like, wow, she got really good really quick. And she took whatever feedback they gave her and applied it immediately. And then as I watched her grow and grow and grow, and I said, oh, my gosh, I completely got Charlotte Flair wrong and she is a talent and I've seen her evolve and grow even further now backstage I cannot speak for her she might be difficult to work with she might not but I do feel that yeah you know she does get an advantage for being Ric Flair's daughter but that's also kind of a curse because now you're held to a way higher standard because you are Ric Flair's daughter and you know what I do want to back up Charlotte here and say you know what you have you know continually met expectations and exceeded and i hope she just continues to push to be the best version of herself so um that's a little update on charlotte flair will she go to AEW? i don't think the wwe will let her out of that contract um i know right now they're in a different mode of expanding their brand but they're not going to let somebody like that just go and walk over to AEW that easy i could be wrong they did do the same with bray wyatt possibly we don't know yet All right, I want to get into a little business with the WWE. Um, This is going to lead into our next story also, which is uh, we're going to talk about the referees, and we're going to talk about the 10 bananaments, as I like to call them. So I've been wanting to give you this scoop and story for a while. So imagine you're going to work somewhere, and it is extremely micromanaging, 
and so much to the point that you are told what to say, you are told what to do, every minute of your life and every word that you're using, you are going to have verbiage that is dictated by you, okay? And I'm sure some of you guys have worked in an environment that is a micromanaging type world, right? And so one of the things is um, the WWE has gotten reports of being in that kind of environment, very controlling, very like in and out. And now to the point, you know, we're starting to affect not just the performers, but the referees. So the referees now, um, is they're making some strange, um, WWE is known for making strange production choices, but and they've been mocked for the fans for their list of banned words. That's one thing that we're actually going to go on in our next story into today. But they also face controversy over ethicals, um, ethically suspect international events. Former talents have even accused the company of rigging crowd reactions. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say some things in there, but I will say uh, the WWE does put on a brand. They put on an entertainment, and they do sometimes want to create an effect in the arenas to cause the talent that they want to get a reaction for and the talent that they don't. Um, that's a bit of that entertainment style and that business, right? Um, I don't know how much of that I'm allowed to say or want to say because, um, you know, honestly, guys, I got to keep mindful too as, you know, I have some involvement with stuff. But ultimately, I will say that any show you will have the idea of trying to influence your audience, okay? And that's a live theater type thing. You do want to get the right reactions out of your crowd and audiences. And sometimes you help the environment to do that. I'm going to leave that where that lies and say it like that. Um, just because I got to be careful what I say here on the channel and due to my connections to the wrestling industry. But ultimately, um, you know, rigging the crowd reactions, nothing interesting to quirk about with the WWE production has now surfaced. And, uh, to make their athletes look even bigger, the WWE is now trying to recruit shorter referees, if you believe it or not. Um, this is also the reason why the company hires short, shorter interviewers, such as Kayla Braxton. Um, Dave Meltzer, again, of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, dropped the tidbit in this week's issue, and he said the create uh, creative production decision includes the dramatic overhaul of NXT. And during the pandemic, the WWE created... Thunderdome in lieu of live crowds, and the fans were able to virtually attend WWE television events through their webcam. While it was an interesting idea, the company clearly preferred live events. The news comes with an interesting timing, and last night's Dark Side of the Ring actually featured a story from the WWE steroid trials in 1993. I do want to check that one out myself. It's going to be very interesting. Um, and at the time, the movement to the smaller more athletic wrestlers in the steroid testing policy were part of the company's response to the public demand for the end of anabolic steroids in that era. Now, with a full wellness policy in place in the WWE, the company is looking for creative ways to make wrestlers seem larger again. And it seems like one of those ideas is Vince McMahon came up with himself and he said, the attention to detail is certainly admirable, but also reeks of micromanagement. Um, it could also be a matter of time before this new mandate turns into a discrimination lawsuit. So that's a very interesting point. So here's where you get into, guys. Yes, it could be a discrimination lawsuit if you say, I'm only going to hire this person who is under five foot five tall, right? Because you do have to have equal opportunity, employment opportunities. Now, since they fall under the entertainment era, you do, in that era, have the right to what's called cast for certain parts and positions. So one of the things I'll give you guys an example, and let's say if you're going to cast and make a Simpsons movie, you're going to have to cast somebody off of a look, or are they going to be able to maintain that look to play the part of Homer Simpson? Just as the point, if you need to cast somebody to play Bart Simpson, you're probably going to need more of a kid to be casted for that, right? So you do have this in the entertainment industry. Um, you know, nobody's going to want to see you know, a super skinny Santa Claus, right? Like you have to do certain things to make the character come to life. Um, it's always kind of an etchy road, but at the end of the day, you know, the companies do have that right to hire who they want. So 
The other thing I want to kind of talk about with these uh, referees and these salaries is, you know, so we're going to look for shorter referees to enhance the talent. So that's not a terrible thing. And so that also um, we're looking so that we're enhancing our products. It's no different than, you know, any of the other enhancements that we do overall. But um, the referees do play in a very important part in the wrestling world. So um, a lot of you guys, you know, may be aware the referees are actually, I don't know if you guys know this or not, they're the ones that actually will help guide the pacings of the matches and call for the spots. They also have a huge job on um, notifying if a wrestler gets injured in the ring in a legit manner and they do have powers to stop the matches. Referees also hold a bit of an earpiece in their ear in which production is telling them to maybe end the match. So they will be told sometimes, hey, the crowd's not catching on. Go ahead and cut the match off at the next spot, which would be this spot. Or, And then the referee's job is to communicate between the wrestlers and the back production. So the referees are a very important job. Um, my curiosity is how much do you guys think a WWE referee – makes in salaries and fees so this is another factor because since this position is so important and if you guys notice these careers have pretty long you know longevity to them you see a lot of the same referees because they got a lot of experiences and since they're so pivotal to the show they do a really good job and then you know these guys are kind of hard to find and hard to train and once you get one that has that if factor you want to keep them so i'm going to show you guys this is for 2021 so this is the most update. The WWE referees per match fees and bonuses for 2021. So if you guys look here, we have the official. So we have a couple different things. We have professional referees and we have entry level referees. So per match, a entry level referee will make $800. A professional referee status will make $5,000. For main events, well, the entry level referees don't get to do main events because they're not professional referees. The professional referees will get $15,000 per main event. Annual earnings roughly for entry level referees comes up to about $150,000. Annual um, earnings for a professional referee will be about $500,000. Their appearances are going to be pretty much main event and pay-per-view events. Where your entry level referees get about only weekly events. So, just to wanted to share this since we were talking about referees and a little research I did. But it's um, you guys, if you want a new career and you want to work in the wrestling industry and you want to train yourself and get some training on it, a referee might be the way to go, guys, because you can make a living and make a big impact in any organization and be paid for your time and have more of a longevity of a job. So. WWE referees, I enjoy their work and they play a big part in the programs that I love and enjoy. But I wanted to share that with you here on Tap Out Talk, so I hope you guys appreciate that. Let's move on to our main story of the evening. So we go from referees to the 10 bananments, as I call them. So, as I said earlier, and we hinted at it, there are certain ways the WWE and sports entertainment world operates, and I'm going to share those with you now. I shared a little bit about referees and a little bit about salaries, and, and again, I do have to keep in mind how much I share and give with you guys um, here on the channel. However, you know, I don't mind sharing that either because um, even though I am a little connected with the wrestling industry, I, you know, I'm not all the way in, right? So, and I am a student of this game and industry. So I have what I call the 10 bananaments, and let's get right in. So here, what you guys are going to see is some production um, printouts of what talent and on-air talent are, and, and employees of the WWE and what they're allowed to say and what words they should avoid. So I want to share that with you today on the channel. Um, so let's just go right down the line. So again, imagine working in an environment where you're told how to perform, what to say at every single point. Some people might think this is harsh. Others might say, well, I'm giving you a script. I want you to follow the script and do it as it's written. I'll let you be the judge of which is better or which is worse, right? But here's the words to avoid that are recommended by WWE employees. Belt, okay, or strap. The wording is we don't have belts or straps. We have championships and titles. 
the belt represents something. Uh, talk, uh, talk about what it represents, hard work, dedication, or it means accomplishment of goals, bullseyes for others, okay? So uh, they would like you to not use the word belt and strap, instead use championship and title, okay? Um, the business or our industry, they want us to stay clear of these kind of words because it's that illusion of wrestling and reality, right? So um, feud, war, those are the no-go words, okay? Again, that are told you cannot say feud, you cannot say war. Um, performance slash performer or choreograph. We want to avoid those kind of words, right? We would like you to use the words superstars or you know, divas or um, talent is another one, right? House shows. And um, instead of house shows, they want you to use the word live event, okay? So it's just they're trying to get out of this backstage type stuff. In that words, we can't use the word backstage because it alludes to a stage. We have to use the word in the back or in the locker room area. We have to describe the areas instead of saying backstage because, you know, even though it's entertainment industry, we don't want we don't give the illusion that it is a wrestling industry. On that note, we do not want to use pro wrestling, pro wrestler. Instead, we would like you to use superstar, star, or athlete. Um, you know that one's a little weird for me, right? Because we're wrestling; these are wrestlers, but we don't want to get we want to get rid of professional wrestling and we want it to be sports entertainment. Um, I am okay with athlete, though. I like using athlete because these guys are athletes, right? Even though if it's predetermined or not, we want these guys to feel like they are athletes because they do physical features. Um, instead of international, we want to use the word global. This is for inclusion. This is to get the world. The WWE is the world wrestling entertainment, so the world is global. Um, when you get international, it says that we only go internationally, but we want the idea that our brand is all over the place and we're invested there. Um, what about uh, shot? Nope, there's no title shots. Okay, you have opportunities in the WWE, but you don't have shots, okay? Um, acrobatics. Interesting is one of the banned words. Hmm, interesting. DQ is also banned. Talent. Okay, so instead of talent, we would like you to use star, superstar, or diva. These are the brands of the sports entertainment world, and they're not talent. They're stars, superstars, or divas. Um, instead of using me, you we would like you to use me or I. We don't want to use me or I. Inside terms are going to be heel, baby face, blown up, shoot, rib, or mark, etc. So no inside uh, the industry terms should be used on TV. So heel is a bad guy, just so you guys don't know. Um, Babyface is a good guy, wrestler. Uh, blown up, self-explanatory. A shoot is going to be a real-life situation that happened in the wrestling match, so something that was real, that wasn't planned. A rib is a joke, like you're ribbing somebody. And then a mark is, sometimes that's the fans. That's what we're called, right? So anybody that is a mark, it's like for the industry. And so it's like anybody that enjoys the product as a mark, it's kind of a derogatory term, but it's, you know, sometimes people get called smart marks, right? But it is what it is. It's like jobber, right? Which, by the way, you're not allowed to use jobber either. I'll give you a bonus one here. You have to use enhancement talent because the term jobber is shown as derogatory. So, um... Instead of U.S., we want to say United States. Instead of fans, when possible, refer to the audience as you in your speeches. Okay, so we should say you guys instead of you fans. It gives them an inclusion in the show and that you recognize them. In other situations, refer them as raw fans or our fans, okay, and Cena fans, etc. Um, instead. Instead of hospital, we're going to say medical center. Okay, this one comes from uh, when we'd say they're at this hospital. Well, unfortunately, in the industry, we would have some kind of crazier fans that would actually look up the hospitals in the area that the talent went to or the superstar went to, 
and then they would stalk the hospital because there's only so many hospitals in the area. So we started using the word medical center to get rid of you know that kind of a vibe and blow off the heat so that they didn't just go to a hospital. Uh, instead of faction, we use the word group now. And so that's another just, you know, some of the demandments, uh, right? Um, they also ask that we please use now available instead of on sale. Sale uh, seems like you're nickel and diamond somebody, so you want to make things available to people. And then we never want to use the term, the title is on the line, okay? Please use more creative terms like the title will be defended, etc. Okay? So these are some of the terms that um, we're not allowed to use or to avoid in any of our interactions with the audiences and with the televisions. I also want to share with you guys a general list of banned words that are to not be used ever in the WWE universe or in WWE world, right? So blood choke belt strap diva okay that first row there uh blood because we are in a pg era same with choking belt strap we covered that those should be championships diva because we are trying to go for a uh, female's equality so they are superstars or talents right so um they're trying to get rid of the diva i never understood that because i always liked diva as the female wrestlers, right? So you have superstars and you have divas. And I, I just always thought diva was a nice definition for the lady wrestlers. Um, headshot, okay, because again, modern day stuff. Trauma, um, and we're not allowed to use the word kayfabe. So if you guys don't know what kayfabe is, kayfabe is, all right, let me explain this. If I was out and it was a bunch of wrestlers or a bunch of you know talent or employees, and kayfabe used to be a word that actually, if I was out and about and we were talking about storylines and sense and we noticed that there were um, possible fans around or people around that could hear us talking, kayfabe was a code word. So I would simply look at you and I would say, hey, yeah, we're going to go ahead and do this finish and we're going to work on it for the title. And oh, kayfabe, 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 guys. And when we said kayfabe, that was like code word for everybody needs to be quiet right now because I think people are listening to our conversation. That was to protect the industry. Um, I actually like that word. I like that the industry had a culture in, within itself. And I think it's kind of cool to say kayfabe. I remember uh, one wrestler I worked with when I first met him uh, was one of the Batten twins. And we, you know, I, I use this word kayfabe and he's, it was weird because he was amazed. He's an old school wrestler and he goes, man, he goes, the way you talk, he goes, it's insane. It blows my mind. He goes, it's like you've been in the locker room with me. And it's like, you know, all this stuff about the industry. He's like, you're educated about it. Um, you know, he would understand that it is a modern day world where we can find a lot of this information. Continuing on, other words to avoid, mofos, obviously. Um, house show, again, we mentioned that. DQ. Instead, disqualification, right? That's what you want to say. The anti-diva, kind of same deal. Spinal injuries, because that's a risky business right now. Victim, violence, and violent, all banned words. Wrestling wrestlers, WWF, absolutely banned word. Even though it was the name of the company previously, there was a lawsuits aspect to that. So that's why it became the WWE back in the day. And they knocked off that you know, F and they said, get the F out kind of thing. Um, we don't want to use the wife beater, which is sometimes a reference for a t-shirt style, um, a tank top. Curb stomp, we don't want to use. Um, that is actually uh, due to the violence of the nature, and that actually came from Vince um, when when um, Seth Rollins was doing the curb stomp finishing move. Um, he actually asked him to stop because Vince you know, really just had it in his mind. He, he just couldn't imagine some kid in a playground doing it and he asked Steph to stop it because he's like, I just don't, I have a bad feeling about this idea of what it could do. Um, phrases including the word push or being over. These are industry terms, guys, so I'm going to teach you. The word push basically means a wrestler is going to be pushed to the title and become a main star, right? And then being over is when he's pushed to the title and the crowd is over him, meaning like not over in a bad way, but over him like, wow, he's over. They love him. He can control the crowd. So that was the meaning of that. So they would like us to you know, avoid those industry inside terms. 
Babyface is a good guy. Heel is a bad guy. Job or jobber. So the idea is you're working a job. If you are a jobber, you are the wrestler that always um, is brought in to lose the matches to make the other wrestler look good. This was more common in the 80s and 90s. Uh, nowadays, we call it um, enhancement talent is what we're supposed to call it. Okay, so the card the card is basically the um, lineup for wrestling matches for that night. Uh, strangle, we can't use. Kill or murder, just because those are not PG era related words. So yeah, I know it's a little you know lengthy, and I mean some of these are a little bit controlling, but I do feel like this band word list, uh, it's how the WWE wants to do business and be projected as a company. So I wanted to give you guys a little insight because I know as fans sometimes, especially if you're getting into this and learning, you might not know what some of these things are. I'd like to think if you're watching Tap Out Talk with me that you're going to learn something along the way like these things because you know my job is to educate future fans and also talk with this stuff about regular fans so we all speak the same language um but yeah guys you can watch this video as much as you want if you ever need kind of a refresher on it or just you know reach out to me in the comments i'll be more than happy to help answer your questions let's move ahead all right so now on the interest of banned items and these 10 bananas by Vince McMahon, right? What do you guys think of this? Is this a rough work environment or is this some kind of standard and run of the mill? Before I go, I have one more bonus item for you on this, you know, idea. So my next uh, page here, I'm going to show you guys and I'll attempt to read off to you is a copy of a production sheet. And what I want to do is... Um, I'm going to read it to you best I can because it's not the best image, but it is something that got sent over to me. Okay, so as you guys can kind of see here, and I'll try to read as best I can. It's a little bit of a weird picture. This is a WWE live production sheet, okay? And this was from back in, now what was it, 2017 or 2016? So this tells you, you guys get these when you go do a production visit and when you're working for the company, right? So when you're working for the WWE, it's like any show, there's a script or a production, right? So VKM notes for live events. VKM is for a Vincent Kennedy McMahon, okay? So these are straight from Vince. It said, per our conversation with Vince, and this is usually come from the production assistant, please, no pile drivers. Also, if there's anything you think, um, and please um, contact Michael Hayes for more information. So if anything you think would be dangerous. Uh, also, referees are not to play a factor in finishes. It's important to keep their credibility. Do um, not compromise the referee or put them in a compromising action. So, you know, these are just all notes from Vince to the production team and how they should go about business tonight. Please make sure that all talent do not go up on the ropes during the entrances. So, no talent up on the ropes during the entrances of the other wrestlers. Because it takes focus off of the entrance. So you have to let the guys enter and then you have to do your in-ring. And going up on the ropes is an in-ring you know, part of your entrance. Uh, please says uh, some of the new ones. No impromptu talent promos. Promos must be approved ahead of time by Michael Hayes or by the um, aid, lead agent or producer. Okay, And the talent must run the promo content by an agent or producer um, it must approve it. No one is to do the yeah, boo, yay, boo stuff except for John Cena. Okay, so that's very interesting for this production note. Um, so it's interesting because um, he was given that as a tool for his character. The production agent also knows. It says no low bullows. Also, any use of chairs, tables, or other objects must be approved first. Also, the agents need to approve heels taking a walk during their matches and to limit the top matches only. So that's a lot of information, guys. Um, and again, I'm just trying to peel back the curtain, uh, the you know the, the steel curtain here for you guys because I want to just share this with you guys as true wrestling fans. And I want to give you a peek back in the industry behind the scenes here. Um, refs and producers, if a talent takes a bad bump or seems to have hurt themselves. Stop the match and check on the talent. So this is for the referees and the producers. Remember what I said earlier, the referees are huge in getting talent and controlling the match and the pace and making sure everything goes right. So that's why they make those big salaries I mentioned. If the referee is unsure um, if the talent is okay, 
Wave, ring side, wave the ringside doctor in to check on the talent, all while moving the opponent to a neutral corner. Okay, so um, if the doctor deems the talent is unable to continue, stop the match and have the injured talent help to the back if for medical attention and award the match to the opponent. If the talent wants to continue and the ref and the doctor agree that we can continue without doing further damage, then the talent should be able to get their feet get to their feet on their own, and the ref can restart the match at any time. Um, anytime the competitor is really hurt, the ref should you go to their opponent, stand in front of them with his arms crossed, and this is the sign that the match has been stopped. Please pass on to the talent and referees. So this is called the referee uh, death cross or the X sign, right? So it's like a DX sign for referees, um, but they hold it up above their heads and they cross their arms, okay? And that's a real-life situation where you say hey this guy's hurt can you please get a doctor out here or telling the other talent hey stop it beating up up stop hitting on him he's hurt okay so this is to protect the wrestlers in this industry um, if a serious injury has occurred so it's a good rule to have um, if the talent takes a bad bump or seems to have hurt themselves do not give in to the talent who want to quote unquote suck it up and continue the match the talent's uh, well-being is always first. This is the policy of WWE. Note, if the talent is opened up and you must stop the match later in the show, if the cut is closed and the bleeding is stopped, it's okay to send the heel back out to cut a promo bragging about their victory and send the baby face to the ring, a uh, spirit of 76, to then make a comeback and hit the finish uh, on the heel. So this is a way to kind of get their win back or their momentum back right we have a final note um if we do a ref bump during a match where the ref gets knocked down have the ref bump to the floor and have a second referee come down and finish the match please do not have the ref that was bumped remain in the ring peeking to see when he should get up and finish the match that's a really good rule from a production standpoint guys um you don't want him laying and peeking right you want him to be injured he's injured he's done Get him out of the ring. Get the new ref in. That's the policy for the WWE live events. So, guys, again, I wanted to share this with you here on Tap Out Talk. Uh, this is a story I've been wanting to share for a long time. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, um, definitely, you know, like, share, subscribe. Share this with some friends that maybe want to learn about wrestling. And, you know, let them come to this podcast. And, you know, I'm definitely willing to answer questions down below as well. Or just shoot me a message on media. But at the end of the day, thank you again for watching. You guys are amazing. Um, I find it's very interesting how, you know, the WWE has their, as I called it, 10 commandments, right, of things you can't say and do. But there's a lot of companies that have these. And if you look at them, there are some good rules in here, and it keeps the business very clear and defined. Some of the stuff does get a little crazy, I will admit. And there are certain times where you're told to cheer or boo for certain people if you are members of these crew. Um, but, you know, that is just because they're trying to sway these storylines in a certain way. But again, guys, thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, please, you know, shoot them down in the comments and I'll do my best to get back with you guys. I'm happy to always kind of help out a little bit. But for now, thank you for watching. And again, you guys know, share it with a friend. Subscribe. I love it. Helps out my channel. But for now... You know it's game over.